I think we're just about there as the lights go down. All right, welcome. We're going to pray. A whole bunch of announcements. And then we've got a, a really cool message for you today. So uh, pray with me if you would. And uh, thanks for putting your phone phones away. Appreciate that. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this group. Thank you for this day. And uh, I just, I lift up uh, the time we have together today that you would use it um, in our lives to, to, to bless other people and uh, to bring glory to you. Thank you for loving us. Um, thank you for your, your patience with us. Um, thank you for your grace. And may we be grace givers to those around us. In your name, amen. All right, get ready. Birth rate time. There are four. So, as we say, to the four of you, good job being born. Keep it up. All right. Here comes the list. This is the updated list. I've gotten a few more. If your name does not have a line through it, that means I still need it. Remember, that card is a kid, all right? So you got to think of it that way. Uh, I would like to send these in by the end of the week, all right? So for some of you, you got to figure out some way to remember. All right, because what's currently, <laughs> your current process is not successful. So uh, f figure out a way to, uh, to remember, and I need those cards back uh, in good condition uh, as soon as possible. All right, there's the list. Would you please welcome, from the high school, my good friend, Mr. Larry Anderson. Bring back good old memories here. Sometimes he puts a picture up there that isn't very flattering, but I see you guys all the time. I'm Mr. Anderson. I do at the high school what Mr. Olson does at the junior high, and he wears some other hats, I understand, like spiritual life coordinator, and I wear some other hats as well, like emergency preparedness coordinator. So I'm not sure if your teachers told you, but last Thursday and Friday we had some they were interesting meetings, um, and it was helpful, but one of the things that we, one of the sessions we had was on uh, having an, what happens if we have an intruder on campus. And that's something that we think about all the time, and it's, it's a little scary, to be honest with you. But um, uh, what I, I, I guess I kind of want us to think a little bit about this, because I, I knew a wise coach who once said, we practice so you will learn the right way to do it. If you cheat in practice, you're going to cheat in the game. And if you cheat in the game, you'll cheat in life. So I have, I, I have a feeling we have some basketball players in this room and some softball players and baseball players. Is that true? Got a fair number of you? Okay. If, if you're a basketball player, you do one thing over and over and over again, and that is shoot free throws. And you may shoot 100 a day, 200 a day. Why do you shoot so many? If you play baseball, you'll, you'll have some pitch to you. Pitch, pitch, softball too, pitch. Pitch, pitch. Can we go to the batting cage and have the you know, pitch, pitch, pitch? And why do you do it so many times? Because when you get to the free throw line, put your toe to the line, you're ready to take your shot, you've done it so many times it becomes automatic and you don't worry about those people behind the basket cheering and yelling and you don't worry about mom and dad going, make the free throw. Or when you get into the batter's box and you get your toe hole in there and you're ready, when that ball comes, you've made contact so many times, you know exactly what to do. So in schools, we practice fire drills. And we learned last week, 
in the last 50, five zero years, how many students have died in a school because of a fire? Do you know how many? None. Okay. So we, we practice lockdown drills and, uh, uh, and, and earthquake drills and fire drills so that you will know what to do when the time comes that you really need to be thinking about it. So in the next couple weeks, either this week or next week, we're going to have a lockdown drill. Just to let you know, follow your teacher's directions. Now the last time we had a drill, we had a big, big mistake. And that is some of you texted your parents and said, we're in a lockdown. You know what happened? Parents left their work and drove here to get you. You realize that's the last thing we want parents to do? To drive to a place where trouble is happening? So you need to do us a favor. When we have a lockdown drill, please do not take out your cell phone. Do not text your parents. We would certainly don't want your parents to come to the campus and get harmed themselves. Maybe you would like that, but we don't want that. Okay, we, we need your parents safe. Um, in April or May, we're going to do another type of intruder drill, but just so you know, we're going to practice so that if and when the time comes, we know what to do. That's teachers and students. So it's a safe place for all of you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. All right, a word from your student council. Okay, so if you guys play an instrument, we will be having a chapel where we sing. Um, so if you guys play an instrument, please come talk to a student council member, and we can talk to you about playing in front of the students for chapel. That, that chapel will be in May, by the way. All right, really important, couple of changes for talent show uh, auditions. All right, still going to be on Thursday during clubs, but the springtime is very, very busy, lots of activities, so we have to structure our time in such a way all right, that, that we're able to do this right. So if you're on the track team, you have an early dismissal on Thursday at 2.10. You'll be leaving for West Seattle Stadium at 2.20. So therefore, if you are going to audition in the talent show, you need to go to the NPR, which is a change, all right, right when, about 1.35, right, right when club time kind of gets going. And, and then if you are not on the track team, and you don't have an early dismissal, then you can come at, at 210, all right? And, and please talk to your, your club leaders and so on. But if everybody comes at once and the track team have to go, uh, it's not gonna work. So if you're on the track team, know that, plan on it ahead of time. It is now gonna be in the NPR, it is not gonna be here. High School Chapel is gonna be going on. So it's all down in the junior high area. And then this is the big thing, in order to be efficient with our time, be, be ready to go with, with what you need. And I've made a couple of arrangements with a few of you, just due to equipment and so on. But if I haven't talked to you specifically, this applies to you, and uh, please make sure you're ready to go. And because the big things that we're looking for in terms of, of, of the audition is really what equipment or space, what needs do you have in order to do it well? And secondly, how, how long is your act? All right, because we need to plan out the, the time accordingly, and then we'll make the schedule based on that. So um, you, know, you don't have to do it perfectly. Uh, perfection is not the goal here, but, but do be prepared uh, as best you can, okay? So that's that. Uh, a word from Mr. Sloan, uh, who's actually not here. He's doing something for high school track, but he sent me a message. And it is this. So PV stands for pole vault. So he says the pole vault up on the track looks like a comfortable place to lay on a warm and sunny day. And it is. However, uh, it is also a very expensive place to lay. The new cover we just bought, which does not have any holes in it yet, was $1,500. And say this out loud, not actually, but, and the foam, the actual pads, $20,000. Yep, 20 grand. So when he says, please don't play or lay on the pole vault, that's why, right? We're not, we're not trying to kill your buzz here. We're just saying, hey, you know what? That's not what it's for. We need it to last a long time, and, and it wears down due to people just goofing around on it. Um, 
So he says, if you're interested in pole vaulting, uh, come out for track and field or talk to Mr. Sloan. Uh, and uh, Rachel Rowe is pole vaulting. So that is super cool. I, I was not a pole vaulter, which I know is, is surprising to, to a lot of you. But um, anyway, so we'd love to see that happen. Uh, junior high track has their first meet on uh, Thursday. So anywho. All right. As we, shift, as we shift to our speaker, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I went, by, by comparison, uh, so I went to large, I grew up in Oregon, large public schools. Uh, my middle school was three grades, uh, had 1,000 students, and then my high school was sophomore, junior, senior, and we had about 2,200 students. And one of the, which was fine, all right, it was school. But one of the downsides of that is you don't, you don't get to know your teachers very well. And a lot of your teachers you don't get to know at all because you just never have them. I remember sitting even at my own graduation. I graduated with 660 people. I remember literally thinking, like, who are these people? Like, apparently I've gone to school with them for, for several years now. I don't know who they are. Because you just don't have classes with, with people. Uh, and you don't get to know teachers. And the other part of it was that it was a bit of an impersonal environment. One of the neat things about being at a place like Bellevue Christian, whether it's teaching, whether it's being a student, is that there is that relational dynamic, and you do get to know your teachers. And, and I, I hope you know this, but your teachers really love you. Your teachers really care about you. We like what we do, and we love who we do it with. And one of the neat things about a place like this is that chapel is an opportunity for teachers to come up and, and to share their heart with you, to share their story, to share uh, things that they really believe and things that they care about. So that started last week with, with Mrs. Monsingo. And the, the next, uh, there are quite a few chapels from here to the end of the school year which are going to fe feature teachers talking to you um, in, in a real personal way. So we're going to continue that today. So I would love it if you would be uh, a, an absolute great uh, audience for uh, my good friend, uh, Mrs. Schmier. So welcome her if you would. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Um, the story that I'm going to tell you guys today, um, there's parts of it that might be a little hard to hear, um, but I've, I've talked to Mr. Olson, I've talked to Ms. Winskill about it, and um, they've both given me uh, the okay to go ahead and share that with you. Um, but I'm going to be sharing some life lessons that I've kind of picked up along the way and um, some stories of my life. Some of it you're going to laugh at, I hope, because it's funny. Um, but we're, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. All right, so. Oh, um, do I not get my transitions? What's that? Do I not get my transitions? I left them as, okay. they, as they were. Okay. All right, um, I'm starting this out in that it is rare to meet a strong person who has had an easy past. Now, strength comes in different forms. Some of you guys are very strong physically. Some of you guys are very strong emotionally. Um, what gives me strength is some of the things that I've gone through. Just like when you put something in a furnace, um, like gold, it becomes purer and it becomes more refined, but it involves heat and pressure. Um, rocks can change under heat and pressure, so um, sometimes trials will actually strengthen us over time. And so this is, uh, this is where I'm kind of coming from. So this message of my, uh, this part of it is talking about the importance of using your life and your testimony as a blessing to others. Um, and some words of wisdom to live by. One of the only things, in fact, the only thing we can take to heaven with us, we can't take um, anything else other than what Jesus has done in our life. And that your story is so important, and your story is so important to share with other people because a lot of times we get this um, idea that we're the only person that's ever gone through something. And with seven billion people on this planet, it's a pretty good bet that somebody else has gone through what you're going through right now. Um, and so by sharing that, it's, it's basically saying, um, for some of you, I get where you're coming from. 
this is one of my favorite Bible verses. Um, this is Jeremiah 29, 11. How many of you have uh, heard this before? And this applies to all of you guys. Um, in Jeremiah, it was in a specific context, but it's also true. Um, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And that's kind of the big picture. But God also has a destiny for you guys every day. There's people that he wants you to meet every day. There's things he wants you to do every day. So it's something that, um, it, it, it's a destiny that, um, that happens every day. The other thing about that is that God doesn't promise us tomorrow. We're here today, but things can happen. And so um, it's important that you use the time that you have to reach out and encourage people. Um, don't put off tomorrow and put it off and put it off because there may not be a tomorrow. So not, not a defeatist thing, but um, it, you'll understand why I'm saying this uh, when I go through my story a little bit. All right. This was me on the left, that was when I was born. Um, and this is me a little bit older. My, this is my mom. Do I have a pointer on this? You do, it's the little uh, Right here? Okay. okay. Yeah, this is my mom, obviously my dad. This is my sister, Linda Kay. This was me. And this is my brother, Danny. Um, and the reason that I'm showing you a picture of me when I was really small is that it didn't take me very long to get into trouble. So when I was about two years old, just a little bit older than I was here, um, I had something called the terrible twos. Have you guys heard of that before? When my daughter was two after my life, I was just like, please don't let her be me. Please don't let her be me because um, I got into a lot of trouble. So first thing that happened is um, we had a gas leak across our street. And so they dug a big hole in the middle of the street and I thought, hey, what a great place to play house, you know? So I brought my doll and my blanket, my pillows and everything, and I dropped them in the hole and, you know, did that for a couple of days. And so one day I'm going across and I, I check the, the side street. There's a white motorcycle coming up the road. And I thought, you know, I have plenty of time to walk across. Next thing I knew, bam, the motorcycle hit me uh, straight, ran right, right over me. It got to about the end of the street. And meanwhile, I had kind of crawled off the street using my fingers. Um, and he picked me up and he carried me to the front door and when my dad saw me, he thought I was dead. He thought I was just, you know, I was bleeding and I was in, in a, a big mess. So um, I remember going to the hospital and listening to the person on the other side of the curtain just screaming bloody murder and I was like, okay, whatever they're doing ne next door, I'm not staying here. You know, so the doctor comes and says, says what's wrong? Do you, uh, what hurts? I said, nothing hurts. I'm good. Can I go home now? Um, they stitched me up, they sent me home, and then the same summer, we had some uh, boys in our neighborhood that were bullies. Um, they're probably in a federal penitentiary by now. Um, but they, <laughs> I'm not judging, but um, first thing that they did is that they, they said, hey, there's this dog named Blackie. We want you to pet him. We dare you to pet him. And I don't know what a dare is, I'm two years old, right? So I reach out and uh, Blackie immediately uh, bites me right on the, the head. Um, I don't know how I got home, but I remember coming to and I was in a bathtub bleeding and a doctor with a little black bag, they used to make house calls back then, um, he stitched me up in the bathtub. So the same summer, okay? Third thing that happens that summer is the same boys, the ones that are in the federal penitentiary now, took me um, by my collar and my belt loops and they threw me head first into a creek which caused me to hit a stone and it fractured my skull. Um, so here's a little word of warning for you guys. When you're born, you get a certain number of brain cells, okay? They're called neurons. Um, you don't get like an endless supply of them. So take care of your neurons because um, you need to l make them last a whole lifetime. Uh, and I've, I've hit my head so many times, it's a wonder that I'm actually standing upright at this point. Um, so that was when I was two years old. Now the reason I tell you that is because that plays in uh, to my life a little bit later on. I ended up getting something as a result of all those hit head injuries. This is, this is our cabin in southern Indiana. And the reason I'm pointing out this is because I had a really hard time fitting in in school. Um, and this is one of the reasons. Um, my parents were followers of Yule Gibbons, which was, he was a naturalist, he loved to eat wild stuff, which you'd call weeds. Um, so we ate cattails and milkweed and mus uh, see, native plants, uh, pokeweed, um, all sorts of different types of mushrooms, you know, things that most everybody would leave alone and, you know, we were just eating them like, uh, grazing like cattle, I don't know. Um, we ate milkweed. Um, 
all sorts of stuff. And then really animals in our forest, we had a big forest, so we had turkeys and quail and deer and everything else, but my dad couldn't hit the broadside of a barn in daylight, so they really had nothing to worry about. Um, but the frogs couldn't get away in time, so we had frog legs a lot. Um, and frog legs in a buffet are completely different than frog legs, you know, still attached to the frog. Um, we had snapping turtle, we had muskrat. We famous story is when I went to the refrigerator and I opened up this refrigerator door and I saw a biological specimen and I said, what's that? And she said, it's muskrat. Why is it in there? She said, it's lunch. Um, I'm a vegetarian, um, but that didn't, that didn't float well in my house. We had to eat essentially whatever was put in front of us. So I just wanted to have like normal lunches like everybody else did. And I had such weird things in my lunch all the time. Um, and First grade, I was, uh, we had a friend that shot a moose out in Vermont, and so I was the only first grader in my school to have a moose burger for lunch. So that was, uh, made it kind of hard to fit in sometimes. Okay, case in point. My family was Swedish. Uh, well, they, we still are. Um, but there's my dad looking just ever so dapper. My dad was a great, had great fashion sense. He would wear, um, uh, a red and white checked tablecloth type shirt, um, short sleeve with a pair of Bermuda shorts that were green and brown and yellow uh, plaid, the black socks and the brown loafers. And I would, as a teenager, I would say, I am not going out with you dressed like that, Dad. Um, so my dad, and my, my mom also had kind of, kind of a temper, a, a big temper, um, and I got spanked a lot. Um, to the point where, you know, my mom believed that if you, spo if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And so I kind of grew up thinking that, wow, as much as I get punished, I must be a really, really bad person. So I kind of grew up with that, um, that shadow over me. And in sixth grade, um, my grandmother died. And my grandma was the one that actually stood between my mom and me sometimes when my mom would get really mad. And she'd say, you're not going to hurt that child. Um, but when she died, I was like, who's gonna protect me now? So I grew up, and it was, a, it was a warped sense of who I was, but I just thought, well, I'm getting spanked all the time, so I must be bad. And I, I had a very, very low self-esteem. So, um, my first life lesson to you guys is that everyone is worthwhile. Um, we need to see people with uh, the eyes of love if you judge a book by its cover, you might miss out on an amazing story. And there's also nothing so rewarding as to make people realize that they're worthwhile in the world. You guys are all worthwhile. And don't let anyone ever tell you differently. Um, one of my friends posted this on Facebook the other day. It says, the young couple moves into a new neighborhood. The next morning while they're eating breakfast, the young woman sees her neighbor hanging the wash outside. That laundry is not very clean. She doesn't know how to wash correctly. Perhaps she needs better laundry soap. Her husband looks on, remaining silent. Every time his na her neighbor hangs her wash to dry, the young woman makes the same comment. A month later, the woman is surprised to see a nice clean wash on the line and says to her husband, look, she's finally learned how to wash correctly. I wonder who taught her how to do this. The husband replied, I got up early this morning and I cleaned our windows. And so it is with life. What we see when watching others depends on the clarity of the window through which we work, through which we look. So before you guys make judgments, think about the other person and what their, what their life is like. So a little bit of the struggle that I had to fit in. Um, I have an IQ of about 130, which is not, nothing to sneeze at, but my sister's was like in the stratosphere. So I mean, my sister was the kind of person that would really annoy most of you because she could go into any test on any day. It could be probably quantum physics and she could just, you know, roll out of bed that morning and go in and take it and get an A plus on the test without any work at all. Drove me crazy. Um, I would study and study and study and study. And if I was lucky, I might get a B. Um, but she could just walk into anywhere and just get an A all the time. So my fifth grade teacher, she always compared me to my sister. And she'd always say, well, why can't you be like your sister? It's like, because um, I'm not like a genius level. My dad is the same in the same boat. He was in Mensa. He's a very smart individual, too. But um, I kind of felt like I was a square peg in a round hole. Now, back to what happened when I was two. Um, 
all that stuff caused me to develop a condition called epilepsy. And I was trying so hard to fit in. And what was happening at night is I was having nocturnal seizures. And for those of you that don't understand epilepsy, you have no control over your body when you have an epileptic seizure. Um, it's um, all of your neurons fire all at the same time. So when you guys are sitting out here and you raise your hand, there's a brain signal going to your hand saying, raise your hand. Now just imagine that your brain is sending signals to every single part of your body simultaneously, okay? So you're just, um, it's almost like you're going through electrical shock. Um, one of the problems with that at night is that you have no, like I said, you have no control over anything you're doing, and so it would cause me to have nocturnal seizures, which would cause me to wet the bed. My mom just got furious at that, and I, I didn't know what I was doing wrong. I wouldn't drink anything. And I made the mistake of telling my sixth grade best friend that that's what happened. I said, you know, I, I feel so badly about this. I need to tell you a secret. And then she turned around and she told the entire sixth grade. You cannot imagine how awful that was for me. Now, if, if I had been lucky, we would have moved to like Vermont or something like that. But no, we stayed, we're still in the same house that, um, I've been in my whole life. We never, ever, ever moved. So that reputation that I got in sixth grade followed me right along to seventh grade. And, um, then when your, my epilepsy decided not to stay in bed anymore, decided to you know, have seizures right in the middle of the commons when you're trying to fit in and having a seizure in front of everybody, um, there wasn't anything like sensitivity training, there was nothing like um, bully prevention like we have nowadays, it was kind of everybody for themselves. So I had a really hard time making friends and, and feeling like I belonged anywhere. Um, so eventually there was a group called the Hoods and they were all outcasts, just like me. Um, it was kind of funny, because I don't know if you know that gangs have colors sometimes, but our colors were uh, brown hiking boots with red laces, Wrangler jeans, red uh, checked or red flannel shirts, and bandanas. So essentially we looked like angry lumberjacks most of the time. Um, <laughs> We broke all kinds, people have asked me, you know, well, you were in a gang, did you ever kill anyone? No, I never killed anyone, but we did get into fights. Um, one time somebody, a girl, made the mistake of insulting my sister, and I just kind of popped her in the face and broke her nose like that, so, yeah. No, no, stop, 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 stop. I was, I was not bragging, guys. I'm just saying that that's the sort of thing that we did. Um, I smoked a pack of uh, cigarettes a day by the time I was 13. Um, I had been doing some uh, substances that are now legal in the state of Washington, which I have no idea why that is. But, um, and there's a story one time where, you know, again, my mom always gave me weird lunches, and so I decided, okay, I'm through with weird lunches. I'm going to have a cheese sandwich. And so I'd start kind of putting my, and I, I know you guys can't judge me because I've seen some of your backpacks, but my, back, my, my locker was not so clean. Um, and I just kind of, there was probably, you could do archaeology in there. There's so many layers in that. But apparently there was a couple of, of things that I had forgotten. And so one day we have drug-sniffing dogs come to the school. And I get called out of my classroom, and I am just shaking like a leaf and the police officers and their German Shepherd are trained at my locker and they said can you open up your locker I said yes sir and so I open up the locker and um, the dog is just going crazy and it gets to like the third level and I, I he says what is that what's in that bag I don't know so I pulled it out and he, he says what do you call this I think it was bologna but I'm not sure anymore so the dog was going nuts because I had an old lunch that I, I didn't know about in there so that that got me a little scared um, this diagnosis of epilepsy in eighth grade it led me to many risky adventures, which I'll talk about on the next slide, um, because they kept telling me, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And I'm a stubborn Swedish person, so you don't tell me what I can't do, because I'm going to go and do it just to prove you wrong, which got me into a lot of trouble. Um, by the time high school hit, uh, in junior high, I was clinically depressed. Um, I was in such a bad state because essentially I believed that my parents didn't love me because I got spanked all the time. No one else liked me because I was having seizures. The only people that would accept me were people that you know, weren't the stellar you know, pillars of community or anything like that. And so um, I was actually clinically depressed by the time junior high hit. Um, by high school I was on a path of destruction and despair and I'll talk about that in just a second. And I had lost myself in my attempts to be something that I was not. So in order to have friends, if people said, I like stamp collecting, 
no way, I like stamp collecting too. It's like, I like roller skating. Really, I love roller skating. So it didn't matter what it was. I would, I would do anything that I could to make people like me, you know. So, what, and I wasn't myself at all. I was just trying to be liked. So about taking risks, okay guys? This is a, for you junior high, high boys especially, but girls too, listen. Take risks, but obey the laws of physics, okay? They are they're there for a reason. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. reaction, right? An object in motion will stay in motion unless stopped by another force or object, okay? That's why we wear seat belts, right? We want to make sure that we're all nicely buckled in. To give you an idea of some of the risks that I took, um, we were on the Colorado River, and they said, who wants to jump off this 40-foot cliff into the Colorado River? Me, I want to. And so um, I jumped in, and I got hypothermia, um, just like that. And I couldn't, I'm a good swimmer, but I couldn't move any of my limbs at all, and they had to drag me off the, um, out of the river. Um, I was in a hot air balloon, and lucky me, the hot air balloon caught on fire while I was in it, about 75 feet above the ground. And I saw by the alarm in the, uh, the man's eyes that this wasn't a normal thing to happen because his eyes were like really big. Um, I thought, this isn't good, is it? And we started falling slowly at first because we still had a lot of balloon, but the um, more balloon burned, we were falling faster and faster. We just, by the time we hit, we just slammed right into the ground. Um, in Indiana, we don't have a lot to do, so we went dam sliding. Um, that's like taking three 30-foot 30, 30 uh, waterfalls uh, on a Frisbee. It's actually pretty cool. Don't do it, though. Um, you throw a Frisbee in the water. You sit on the Frisbee like this, and you, take, you let the waterfall take you one over another over another. And then you uh, get down to the bottom, and you walk up, and you do the whole thing again. So uh, that was another thing that I did. Um, and the list goes on. I've, I've done... Oh, I, had a, um, I went up to a 32-foot diving board. This is a, and I'm looking down, and I'm thinking, wow, that's really far. And I was up there for about an hour, seriously, an hour. And a uniformed policeman finally came up, and she said, look, you're going to either have to jump or you're going to have to come down. And of course, pride at this point won't let me come down the, the right way. So I jump, but at this point, I'm so stressed out that I actually have a seizure from 32 feet. And I end up on my back, which, you know, hurts, by the way. Um, so I came to, and I was crying, and instantly, you know, six lifeguards uh, attached me to this metal floating thing and brought me over to the shore. And then um, the last one I'll tell you about is uh, I went skiing. Now, slopes are colored a certain way, for those of you that don't ski, for a reason, you know. And just because blue is your favorite color, that doesn't mean that that's a slope you need to take. Um, especially when you've never had a ski lesson in your entire life and you don't know the first thing about skiing. Because what happens is you go really, really, really fast. Um, really, really fast. So I had no idea what I was doing. I'm just rocketing down the slopes. And I say, how do you stop? They said, cross your skis. So at that very moment, by luck or something else, my skis hit something hard in the snow. And so my skis stop, but not me. I just go flying head over heels with poles, everything else flying. And I land about a foot from the tree with my poles underneath me and face down like from, really face down from a tree like the tree is right here. So that could have ended very differently for me. Um, fortunately, I had a ski patrol that, you know, skied me down the mountain because that's probably the only way I would have actually made it down that mountain alive. So um, just remember that, you know, it's okay to be a risk taker, but just remember that there are, there is a cause and effect and you don't want to do things just to prove somebody wrong. All right, so life lesson number two, don't be a chameleon. I think those are really pretty pictures of them. So what does that mean? A chameleon is a funny creature. You put him on red and he becomes what? Red. You put him on green and he becomes? Green. He adapts and he fits in wherever he is. It's a story, guys. The story goes that a chameleon was put on a plaid blanket and he exploded because he was trying to be too many things at once and his body was tugged in different directions. Now, it's a good thing to be pleasant and accommodating, but I no longer want to be the kind of person who would be anything or do anything depending on the circumstances in which I find myself. Rather than having my surroundings change me, I would rather influence and change my surroundings. That's a better and a higher way to live. The Apostle Paul said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's Romans 12, 2. 
Um, or another way to say that is don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within. So don't be a chameleon. You need to be yourself. So that's the, that's the verse that I just read to you. That's a very, very important life verse, especially in this culture where we live in now that they're telling us certain things um, about how we should live our lives. And if we look at the scripture and what it says, it doesn't match up. So you need to make sure that you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, but not that you're necessarily conforming to what the world is telling you. Because what is right is not always popular, and what's popular is not always right. Be yourself. An original is always worth more than a copy. An original artwork, right, it's worth lots more than a, a photocopy of it. Now, the next thing is talking about the body of Christ. This is why I don't want you guys to compare yourself to one another. Um, I teach a lot of you guys, and I see a lot of your strengths, a lot of your giftings. But there's a natural tendency to want to compare yourself to other people. My sister and I did it all the time. Um, she was brilliant. She could just do so well in school. Um, I'll show you a slide and you'll, you'll believe me, but I actually had a lot of boyfriends in high school. I mean, I think I counted 35 at one point. And it's not that I was really desperate. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Kayla, Kayla uh, Nakamura, where are you? Are you here, Kayla, somewhere? Um, yeah, last year your sister, your sister had a funny dis uh, discussion with me in the car and she said, wow, you must have been really desperate. I said, what? And she says, no, they must have been really desperate. I said, Hannah, you're not helping yourself here. So it's not that I was desperate or anything else. It's just that when you don't have anybody else that likes you and somebody wants to date you, wow, somebody likes me. And I came on so intensely that people would just say, whoa, back off, you know. But it's like, oh, somebody likes me, somebody loves me, that's wonderful. So the thing is, God created all of you to be unique. And, and you guys are, you're beautifully unique. And revel in that. Um, I want to give you an example. Does anybody know how many types of muscle tissue your body has? Good. And what are they, do you know?